In this video, you'll see how the expression for the unloaded Q of a quarter wave resonator is derived. There are various levels of coaxial resonator that I could be considering. The quarter wave resonator on the left is ideally one quarter of a wavelength long, hence the name. A foreshortened quarter wave resonator is shorter because the capacitance from the tuner pulls down the frequency. In a re-entrant resonator, the resonant element is brought so close to the opposite wall that the frequency is pulled down significantly by the high capacitance in that gap. But we're going to focus on the quarter wave resonator, which is ideal and doesn't really exist. All resonators are at least foreshortened. But depending on the degree of foreshortening, the Q expressions for the quarter wave resonator will be applicable, if not precisely, at least somewhat closely. Quarter wave resonators are used in microwave filters. The people at Orion Microwave were nice enough to allow me to show their website on this video. Two foreshortened quarter wave resonator filters are pictured here. On the left, you can see a single six pole filter, and that's the center element that is usually referred to as the resonator. It's a little easier to see on the picture on the right. Copper housing here for a 12 pole filter. The rods are contained inside of a housing that's not quite round, not quite square, and with very large apertures for coupling from one resonator to the next. We're going to calculate the Q for a single resonator ideally surrounded by walls. In our ideal air-filled metal quarter wave resonant cavity you've got a metallic rod with a radius of A and it's in a cavity which I'll call the housing which is also made of metal but empty full of air or vacuum and its length is considerably longer than that of the metal rod and I'm making it considerably longer in order to get that ideal expression. As the housing length becomes similar to the rod length you go from having a quarter wave resonator to a reentrant resonator and the frequency will be pulled down significantly. There are electric and magnetic fields in this resonator, and the ideal depiction of the magnetic field as a quarter of a cosine wave, where z equals zero at the base of the housing, the magnetic field has to go to zero at the end because there can't be current past this point. The electric field, on the other hand, oscillates from very high positive to very high negative at the end, and at zero at the base where the rod attaches to the ground wall. The rod resonates at a quarter of a wavelength, and so we can write down the resonant frequency as C, speed of light in the medium, which is presumably vacuum, divided by 4 times the length. And then there are higher order modes, that frequency, 3 times the frequency, 5 times, 7 times. Every mode must have an electric field maximum at the end of the rod and a current minimum at the end of the rod. And so it's only going to be odd number of modes, so it's 1 quarter of a wavelength long, 3 quarters, 5 quarters, 7 quarters, and so on. And that's the unloaded resonant frequency. But in this case, by unloaded, I mean that wall is way far back, so there's no capacitive loading on the end of the rod. The expression for the electric field comes right out of first-year physics. There are two factors in this expression. The factor on the left you might recognize as the expression for the electric field inside of a cylindrical capacitor. The factor on the right accounts for the Z dependence, where Z is the direction along the rod z equals zero at the base of the housing. The magnetic field also comes right out of a general physics textbook from Ampere's law, the magnetic field between two concentric conductors carrying current, or the magnetic field inside of a coaxial cable, is the factor on the left. The cosine provides the z dependence of the magnetic field. And the magnetic field has to go to zero at the end of the rod, so cosine going to zero at the end of the rod is correct, because there's no place for current to go once it gets to the end. Now you might guess that one of these two expressions is a better description, and you are right. The electric field is not such a good description because, as you can see, the electric field doesn't go abruptly to zero at the end of the rod. The magnetic field certainly does, but the electric field will taper off after it gets past the rod, which is necessary because nature abhors a singularity. You're not going to have a sudden stop in your electric field because you've gotten to the end of the rod. That simple magnetic field description is a more accurate description, and we're actually going to use only that. We don't need to use this expression for electric field. The Q factor for a resonator is a stored energy per cycle divided by the power dissipated, and we're going to go ahead and calculate that. It's a set of integrals. Let's start with the dissipated power, the denominator. Looking at the rod, 
the dissipated power is one half I squared R, or one half times R sub S, where R sub S is the surface resistance in ohms. Integrating over the surface of the rod, surface current density is given by the cross product of the normal with the magnetic field, which is not difficult to handle. The normal coming out of the metal and the magnetic field at the surface of the metal are certainly perpendicular to each other, so the cross product just collapses down to H, the magnetic field evaluated at the surface of the metal. So set up that integral over the length of z from 0 to l, and this factor of 2 pi is the phi integral. 2 pi a dz is an area element on the rod, and you can solve that integral on your own, and you get the power dissipated in a rod. This r sub s is the surface resistance, not to be confused with sheet resistance, which is usually cited in ohms per square. Surface impedance is the electromagnetic wave impedance at the surface of a conductor. It has units of ohms, and surface resistance resistance is a real part of it, and it's determined by knowing the skin depth of the metal. Here I'll write it as the square root of pi f mu naught over the conductivity of the metal. The power dissipated in the housing, which is the outer wall, assuming it to be cylindrical, can be set up with an area element of 2 pi b dz. It's otherwise the same integral, but inspect that expression for magnetic field evaluated at r equals b, and make sure that that's what you have inside the integral. Solve the integral, you have the power dissipated in the housing. Finding the power dissipated on the ground plane is important. I'm not going to worry about the power dissipated on the opposite flat wall, but the flat wall that the rod is attached to is very important. One half r i squared for that now involves an integration over r. We're at z equals zero, so it's just cosine squared of zero. That makes it easy. Solve that integral, and you do have this logarithm. Finally, the energy stored in the resonator is a volume integral of 1 half mu naught h squared is the energy density in the volume. Integrate that over volume and write out the volume element, 2 pi r dr dz, and integrate it over all of the space in the cavity. And you have an expression for the energy stored per cycle, that's in units of joules per hertz, in the resonator. Put these four expressions into the definition of Q. So the energy is on top, and these three dissipated powers are on bottom. And you have 2 pi f outside. Replacing the r sub s's with that expression for r sub s. Simplify everything down to this. The unloaded quality factor of a quarter wave resonator is this expression. And I want to point something out about this expression, because there are a lot of credible sources out there that leave out this term in the expression, which is the ground wall loss term. If there's no loss on that ground wall that the rod's attached to, great, but I don't know how you accomplish that. There's always going to be loss. If you leave out this term, what you have is an expression for the quality factor of a half-wave resonator. That is, a rod that's not attached to a ground plane, rather it's suspended in midair. Sometimes the rod, the housing, and the ground wall are not made out of the same material, and so you might stick with this expression up here in the middle so that you can have a different R sub S, different surface resistance, just supposing you have a different conductivity for the different materials. Uh, that sometimes is the case. It was certainly the case for me when I was working with superconducting quarter wave resonators in copper housings. Let's go ahead and calculate the Q factor for this resonator. The rod radius is 4 millimeters, the housing radius is 12 millimeters, the length of the rod is 30 millimeters, and everything is copper at room temperature. Its frequency should be C over 4L if there's no loading of the rod, and that comes out to 2.5 gigahertz. So I'll call that the unloaded frequency, or the ideal case frequency, because there's no capacitive loading. Use that frequency in your calculation for the Q, plugging in all these other numbers, and you get 4,090. That's the unloaded Q of this particular quarter wave resonator. But wait, we're going to build it, and we're not going to get that. Let's see what the issue is. I'll simulate the same structure in HFSS. We have the exact same geometry. I'll run the simulation, and I'll find a resonant frequency of 2.1758 gigahertz. That's not 2.5 gigahertz. Because of the capacitive loading between the rod and the housing, and between the rod and the end wall, the frequency gets pulled down. Go back and do that Q calculation, but now with the actual frequency that you should expect with all of the loading in the resonator. And you get 3,800. It's not a huge difference, but it's a more appropriate number to be citing. So we'll call 3,800 our analytical result. As long as I have HFSS going, let's go ahead and calculate the Q of that structure. 
It had a 3 decibel bandwidth of 808 kilohertz. That's the distance between these markers you can barely see. It had a insertion loss on resonant peak of minus 11.9243 decibels. So that gives a loaded Q, which is just center frequency divided by the bandwidth of 2693, and an unloaded Q, using this expression, of 3610. If you want to see how this unloaded Q measurement is done, you can see my video on measuring unloaded Q, where I do it two ways. One is this way, and another way uses the return loss, S11 and S22, to calculate the unloaded Q from a measurement. So you can compare that 3610 to 3800 which we got from the simple electromagnetic model. When you bring that end wall in, you'll start to get additional dissipation on the housing wall as you go from quarter wave to significantly foreshortened quarter wave, all the way to re-entrant. So that difference in Q that you get as you bring in the wall is only going to grow, and we'll get farther and farther from ideality. In these expressions we derived, we made several assumptions. We assume that the housing current ends where the rod ends. If we look at the current on the cylindrical wall of the housing, it has to stop where the end of the rod is. But the thing is, the wall continues. And so it's possible that there's more current still over here and over here. And there is, very small amounts. It takes a little bit of distance to actually have unmeasurable current. We assume no power is dissipated on the end wall, consistent with the assumption that no current is set up in the tuner. And that's only true if the tuner's way back. So if the cavity is long. And in our model, we didn't even include the tuner. So no lossy ground current that always happens in the transition from a movable tuning rod onto the housing. Also at the base of the rod where it goes into the housing, you might have loss. It depends. When I worked with quarter wave resonators, we would had silver platings that were placed on top of the whole thing. And so you actually had continuity of metal. But that may not always be the case. Poor contact can be a problem, but I assumed no contact problems. You can account for contact problems, and I've done that before, by putting a very lossy metal collar at the base of the rod. The problem is you don't know what loss to give it. And so you make up a conductivity of that lossy copper that results in the Q that you measure. And then you maybe use that all the time. And again, I assumed a cylindrical housing. But you saw the, the photographs I showed you of the, the filters. They were in these kind of squarish housings uh, with big aperture walls. The difference between cylindrical and rectangular is extra volume in these regions out at the corners. These first two deviations from ideality are actually accounted for in the HFSS model. And that probably explains the very small difference that we did get. These other three are much harder to deal with in a simulation, but you get feel for what to expect from experience. Well, that's my explanation for the unloaded queue of a microwave quarter wave resonator.